All right, our next speaker is Darwin Born and Bred. She attended Pratt Primary School and Darwin Middle and High School before moving to Perth in 2015 to complete her studies. After graduating from the University of Western Australia in 2019 with distinctions in her Master of Professional Engineering, she focused on introducing technical specialists and clients to potential opportunities in the Northern Territory through her role with GHD in Perth. Currently working within the innovation team for BHP in Perth, using her experiences to assess and accelerate sustainable emerging technologies in the mining industry. Bringing the engineering in steam. Let's hear it for our local girl, Alison Dugood. I just wanted to obviously speak to the first two speakers from today. I don't have my PhD yet, but I'm going to start that next year, so hopefully I can get that under my belt. So first thing I just wanted to say, start off with a joke, wasn't planning on it. Um, scabies have some personal experience with that one. So I'm also one of the statistics, thanks dad, for growing up in the Northern Territory. So good morning everyone, almost afternoon. The first thing I wanted to say is I'm Alison and I despise multiple choice questions. It's a bit of confusion in front of you. I find them a really big mental strain. I don't know about everyone else on the floor. They're made to confuse you, right? They write things with double negatives. There's all these nuances of, oh, I think I know the answer, but this one kind of sounds like what I was thinking about in the first place. I really struggle with them because they often don't express my understanding of a topic. So even in the point of AI, your brain works in one way, but what you deliver works in another. This is because my brain's worked to figure out shortcuts. So how can I read a 20-page exam and still get out those answers that I'm looking for? This is because when I was 18, I was diagnosed with severe dyslexia. And I don't know where I'm pointing this. I'm just going to keep... There we go. Um, which I think a lot of you would already understand means that you might misread words, create these shortcuts, might see a letter in one place and not another, and not really understand how to get from point A to point B. Sorry. So where, what does this mean? It means that I've had my own personal adapting learning style. Um, it's personally, and I won't get upset, been a bit of a struggle throughout my schooling um, and throughout my university degree, but it's all about creating a network. So one thing I haven't spoken about much today is a network of both female, male, any sort of gender diverse groups and how we can utilize each other's strengths um, to push forward. So a perfect example of this was when I was in my first year of my Masters of Engineering, where 60% of my grade was based on multiple choice questions. I went into my first test, it was 50% MCQ, 50% um, long answers. I got close to zero on one part of the test and close to 100% on the other. So, guess which part I failed. Although this is a notable part of my personal experience, it's not necessarily a part of my professional development today. So what I want to talk to you all about today is that I'm, as mentioned before, a fifth generation um, Northern Territory Chinese um, from the uh, Larrakia lands in Parap, growing up in a beautiful building that my parents bought apparently with one room originally. And growing up in such an amazing culturally diverse community, which unfortunately my peers didn't experience, has given me this really unique perspective. And it's really important in engineering to not only go up and challenge what these engineering norms are, but also analyze why they existed in the first place. So, what do I do now? There's a few photos, took this last night, wasn't planning on having a slide deck, but then was told that I probably should. Um, I don't have a big swimming or running or uh, career in terms of sport, but I did like being in the NT News when I was growing up. Um, you can see a sort of range of things here. I actually didn't like science or reading or schooling in that regard growing up. And I like doing the little artsy things, so painting your face, stitching things up, um, throwing a thong at the Australia Day thong throwing contests. I don't know if you guys remember them. Um, so as I mentioned, 
proud Northern Territory girl, uh, grew up in the Chunghua Society, Pratt Primary School, Darwin Middle School, which is a bit of a blemish, Darwin High School, went to CDU for a little while, um, and also proudly involved in uh, Variety Children's Charity when I'm up here. So, what do I do? What does everyone think an engineer does? So typically, people think you're building a bridge, civil engineering, right? Maybe, maybe building just where you're working for an office every day. Uh, some people think that I might pull some oil out of the ground. So Impex, um, you're great. You support lots of things in the local community. ConocoPhillips slash Santos, same sort of thing. Uh, and some people think that I might just go work at Ludmilla Wastewater Treatment Plant, right? To make sure we have clean power and water. Don't do any of that, because I think one thing that's not communicated to everyone, studying engineering is not just maths and spreadsheets. It's a lot more complicated. So what I focus on is looking at bridging that gap between really, really amazing technical ideas, advanced generative AI, um, sometimes things in the medical industry, direct air capture, artificial intelligence, etc. Uh, and bridging that gap between these amazing technical ideas and these executive leaders who are trying to make decisions and invest money. So, what, what makes this difficult? A lot of the people who have the best ideas locked in their brains are often regarded as insane, right? You're like, you're an idiot. What are you talking about? What do you mean this computer is going to run um, our entire organisation? But that's usually because there's that gap in communication. What is, what is this originating from and where is it going to end up? So because of my personal limited reading ability, I pride myself on trying to bridge that gap between these amazing scientists globally, and just so you guys know, I've got breathing issues at the moment, hence the crackles, um, and those executive multi-million, multi-billion dollar investments. So that's where I sit at the moment. This is through using things like multimedia presentations, creating beautiful little videos, having, um, sorry, just getting some water from the auntie. <laughs> uh, and communi communicating this not only to executive leadership, but also to throughout the industry. So, over the past few years, I've had the amazing opportunity to work in areas such as direct air capture, which I think you guys all know was a glorified tree, right? You're pulling CO2 out of the air, creating it into rocks or investing it back into the ground, um, and then trying to decrease our overall carbon footprint. That's one example of a cool project. Uh, another one is repurposing of offshore infrastructure. I don't know if everyone knows about the looming problem with Northern Endeavour in the Northern Territory, so it's an offshore piece of infrastructure. There's been some amazing work internationally done in terms of repurposing that infrastructure to create artificial reefs, to create other ecosystems. Um, there's some really interesting studies that have been done in Western Australia where these cute little fishies um, can't survive in our waters anymore because it's too hot, so they go a little bit deeper and they actually use this offshore infrastructure to create their own new ecosystems. So it's some really, really cool stuff. So, what does this all mean? And I will just touch on the other topic that one of my colleagues mentioned, nuclear power. I've also had the amazing opportunity to work on what does this mean for the world, but also what would it mean if it was implemented in Australia, both in things like mining, again, oil and gas, small-scale transportation. If you want to know anything more about that, ask me when it's not being recorded, um, and we can have a little bit more of a detailed conversation. So, what have I learnt? I know I'm maybe a little bit younger than some of our other presenters today, but this sense of self-awareness the courage to push against stereotypes and to be agile in my own career. People often talk when you're in a male-dominated industry about the womanhood. So they say, you know, find other females who you can mentor off. We mentioned that previously. You know, you might be a TV star that you watched when you were growing up. I personally have not had a, a positive experience with this womanhood. And I can see some nods from my friends in the front line uh, where there's been a really negative approach going forward where you're cutting each other down rather than building each other up. 
and where does this stem from? So what I found, um, and I'll give you an example of my career over the past few years, was that I was getting accelerated from being a graduate at University of Western Australia um, to coming through and starting to lead these really technical projects. I didn't really understand why, just thought they were interesting, sounded fun. Um, and some of the female leaders at the time were just being really hypercritical, right? Constantly insulting everything you do, constantly trying to find ways to make you look bad to everyone else in the business. You just don't really understand why. You're like, what, what have I done wrong? Like, have I um, made them look bad? That's a classic one, right? What have you done to make someone else look bad? Have I maybe done something wrong technically? You know, has my work not made sense? And that's why you're um, getting, I guess, highlighted in these situations. So I come back to that network that I spoke about earlier. Having a really tight network, and I will say a female and male, friends, family, peers, anyone that you can confide in, to say, oh, what was I doing in this situation? Because I did this, and this person reacted in this way. And to get that feedback that, no, you're definitely not doing anything wrong in that situation, I think it's their problem, right? A really important thing. Is it your problem or their problem? In this situation, I didn't realise at the time that my supervisor was really struggling to follow my technical um, projects. She didn't have an engineering background. She didn't understand what was actually being delivered. So hence, became this sort of um, disillusion or this uh, divide between the two. I in no way would ever blame her in this situation. And I just want to make it really clear that it's this grapple in engineering that I found between different females. Needing to prove yourself, being simply labelled as a diversity hire, and always doing this at the expense of others. But what does this mean? Self-awareness. I think both of my speakers earlier have mentioned this. Self-awareness is probably the most important thing when you're a female in a male-dominated industry. And I pride myself on empowering everyone around me, um, in particular, obviously, other females, in not pulling themselves down, knowing what their worth is, not just from a technical perspective, but from also a values perspective. This is why it's so important to rely on your personal relationships and also self-check. You're not the only person with an opinion. Other people around you are going to have opinions of what you do. So this awareness and this strength is so important when working in this constantly evolving industry that's currently run by, unfortunately, previously male-dominated corporate structures and rules. Rather than letting the structure dictate your career pathway, I'd recommend that you do what I do, constantly reflect, have a sense of self-awareness, and always look at how these things can align with your personal values. I think, again, both of my colleagues mentioned this sense of self-awareness in terms of environmentalism or environmental sustainability. That's an area that I'm personally quite passionate about and hence why I'm likely gonna transition into restoration projects next year as well. Personally, I have been really lucky to have a lot of strong individuals in my life, all very intelligent, predominantly female, if you know the family, um, who have driven me to this way of critical thinking and problem solving. Originally, I thought this passion would lead me towards a career as an electrician, because I really liked building things. I liked the idea of being in a male-dominated industry and sort of poking the bear all the time. Um, but I instead decided to follow in my sister's footsteps to study engineering at UWA. Over the past few years, and I'm really interested to see what people say on the floor about this one, I've noticed that all of the companies that myself and my sister have worked at have been pushing us towards project management. They keep saying, oh, you know, you've got technical engineering, but you seem to be really, really good at managing people and organising, um, you know, organising events and, and alike. So I just wanted to do a quick show of hands. Has anyone in the room, female or male, experienced that, where they've got a certain discipline, experience, degree, and they get pushed to just do straight project management work all the time? They're organising an event today. Good point. <laughs> um, with that in mind, who has ever seen a male counterpart being asked the exact same task? Can you organise this meeting? Can you take these minutes? Can you 
you know, check in with its co-worker because they just seem a little bit off lately, but I'm, I'm not close enough with them, so could you check in with them for me? These are all these fundamental differences of being a female in a male-dominated industry. For me, it all comes down to this subconscious stereotyping. People assume that it has to do with your personal values and your, you know, interpersonal relationships. However, if you're wasting your energy on something that someone else isn't, that's ultimately going to impact your performance. So if you have a huge mental strain or a huge amount of time spent on trying to ensure all of your co-workers are doing well, um, organising all of the meetings that everyone's going to attend for one hour, but then you're going to have to spend four hours to organise, that's ultimately not going to just impact your professional life, but it's also going to impact your personal life. I find that this is a really, really interesting area because most of the women that I have worked with who have had a positive influence um, often are trying to strive to be better, to prove themselves to be 110% better than their male counterpart. But we don't have to do that. Let our work speak for itself. So stereotyping, a really cool message that I thought we should be pushing through today. The final topic that I'm hoping to get a little bit of maybe laughter from on this one is agility. Who's heard of being agile in their career at the moment, right? It's a new buzzword. Um, even though it's a buzzword, I like it because it's a simple word. Again, coming back to my first point, I don't like comp complex words. I think it makes it too confusing for everyone. So what does it mean to be agile in your career? Again, I'm an engineer and I put that in quotation marks, which basically means you're just a problem solver. With all of these experiences, I have learned that it's really important, again, to come back to your core values and passions. Growing up, I'm sure everyone in the room was told, pick a pathway and stick with it, or what do you want to be when you grow, when you grow up, right? Oh, I want to be an astronaut. Um, I think I want to go and work in the office and, you know, just have an office job, right? It's not very clear, but one thing that people don't acknowledge is it's actually okay to jump between careers. Right? You might be right now an administrative assistant at a local dentist office, but that doesn't mean you couldn't go into um, drone coding and looking at environmental ecology all around the Northern Territory. So there's been this ongoing pressure to fit in with these career models of, okay, you're a project manager, you're an engineer, you build um, bridges. But these models existed before things like advanced AI, things like um, women in the workforce in some instances, and also having this integrated approach of globalisation, which didn't exist in the past either. Personally, I've been working since I was 13, starting as a shop assistant, then going up and being a deckhand, uh, working at CDU as a chemistry technician, a risk engineer, tertiary level tutor, and now innovation engineer. So that's all before I was 30, and that's about seven or eight different career pathways, right? And now I'm looking to change again and do a PhD. So fundamentally, it's important to understand why you do each of those things and how it links into the society's ecosystem. Each of these learnings or each of these areas that I've worked in have provided me with a unique perspective on how we can change the world for the better. At the moment, and I hope for a long time, my personal values are family, so I'm always looking for jobs that bring me home. Security, always looking for a job that pays, that's nice as well and making a positive impact on the world. My work experience to date has been carefully selected to basically hit the nail on the head for all three of those. And if any point that changes, I look to change too. Everyone's experience is different. Mine includes being a female in engineering and to change the concepts that have been in place for decades. This is often difficult and it's going to be difficult for the next 10, 20, 30, maybe 40 years, hopefully, while I'm working, to build a sustainable future. In this room, there's probably maybe 50% of you who would identify as working in, digital, in the digital space, but I encourage you to find even 5% of your year, 5% of your day, to be involved in STEM or STEAM. Embrace your uniqueness, like I have. Have the courage to push against stereotypes and constantly improve. That's it. <laughs> Thank you so much, Alison. <laughs> Such a fantastic role model. Thank you so much for that.
All right, before we do break for lunch, do we have any questions for Alison at all? Great, one over here. Don't give him the mic. <laughs> He's seen me in diapers, doesn't count. Hello, Alison. Hey, Stevie. Um, my question's in two parts. First part, who was your favourite Waratahs hockey coach? <laughs> and oh. second part, have you seen in your short time in the industry, you've started here, you've gone to Perth, you've been in a couple of organisations now, are you seeing change? Melissa Hall, just so you know, Steve. Um, and I want to say yes, whether I think it's the right change is another thing. So I can give you a pretty easy example of this. Again, and don't get too upset, but I've had two experiences with senior males in engineering um, who didn't particularly like females working in the industry. Let's just say that. One of which was with a company that took, I think, nine months to, quote, deal with the issue. Um, with, oh, there was, I think, about five different interview processes, you know. I didn't even want to raise it as an issue. I was just like, get me out, I'll change teams. You know, requesting that you submit these things. Um, eventually, the individual did lose his job, but nine months of, of pain, that's a long time. Compared to my current organisation, where there was one instance where a long-term mining engineer was, let's say, being quite abrasive in a call. Anything I said, everything I said was wrong. If a peer said the exact same thing, oh, that's, that's the best idea, let's, let's go down that pathway. This individual had 25 odd years experience on me. Um, one of those people who likes to use technical language to make other people feel dumb. Within that one meeting, my supervisor at the time, I'd mes messaged them saying, look, I'm happy to keep working with them, but I think you should lead the conversations going forward so that we don't have wasted time. He instantly said, I'm raising this with our supervisor and we're gonna get rid of him within one conversation. So there is change. I would prefer it not to be that abrasive. Um, I think it would be nicer to educate people to understand how we can all work collaboratively together, but yeah, within two years, there was quite a significant change. Thank you, and thank you for asking that very important question. Can we please have another round of applause for Alison Jewgood, please? Thank you so much.